tradition it's from our office book and since the topic is synods this is our prayer for church synods guided to teach the almighty god by the light of thy holy spirit the councils of the pope cardinals and bishops at this time assembled in synod that thy church may dwell in peace and fulfill all the mind of him who loved her and gave himself for her even thy son our savior jesus christ amen Amen. Awesome, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Father. Kelsey? All right. Thank you, Father. Our speaker this evening is a Catholic priest of the Personal Ordinariate of the Chair of St. Peter. Father Eric Bergman serves as pastor of St. Thomas More Catholic Church in Scranton, Pennsylvania, a parish of converts to Catholicism who celebrate the Anglican use of the Roman Rite Mass. A former clergyman of the Episcopal Church and a convert to Catholicism, Father Bergman was ordained to the Catholic priesthood in 2007 under Pope John Paul II's pastoral provision, and in 2012, he became the first priest incarnated in the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter. He serves as chaplain of the Anglican Orm Chetibus Society, a Catholic organization dedicated to increasing awareness of Pope Benedict XVI's 2009 apostolic constitution of that same name. Father Bergman and his wife, Christina, reside in Scranton and have 10 children. Uh, Father Bergman, it is such a pleasure to welcome you back to the Institute of Catholic Culture. Welcome, Father. Thank you very much. We will uh, hand the keys over to you, Father, so this is all yours tonight. Thank you very much. So today, uh, we're talking about uh, synodality, obviously, but in order to do so, we have to begin with a history of councils. And when I wrote the little uh, blurb for this particular class, I talked about uh, Acts 15. I mentioned very briefly Acts 15. This is the first church council in the history of the church. And what happened, if you're unfamiliar with that particular chapter, is there was a debate over circumcision. That is, uh, does a Catholic, uh, to be faithful, have to have his foreskin removed? Does he have to observe the Mosaic law? That is uh, the ritual law that we find in the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, the Levitical law, the 613 uh, prescriptions that are in there. Does a Catholic have to observe the Jewish law in order to be faithful? And ultimately the apostles decided that no, this is not the case. And they did this within the context of a council. They got all the apostles together, including uh, St. Paul, who had been ministering to the Gentiles. And St. Peter gave his testimony about how, in fact, the Lord had appeared to him and made it clear that uh, the Gentiles were the Lord's intent as well, not just the Jews. And that, indeed, a person did not need to be circumcised in order to be a faithful Christian. And so... There was a letter written in it, and I want to, if you have your Bibles, of course, you could open uh, to, to Acts 15. And there is a, a letter in there, after the decision has been made, that they send to the Christians at Antioch. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. To lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. That you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from unchastity. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. And that letter obviously indicates that clearly they had made a doctrinal decision that we are saved by faith, not by observance of the Mosaic law. But at the same time, within that same council, there's a decision with regard to certain disciplines that they should observe. And one of them is abstain from what is strangled and from blood. Now, all of us know that today uh, it's not uncommon to have a blood sausage, for example. So there's nothing doctrinal about abstaining from blood. That was part of the Mosaic law. But 
it would have alienated the Jewish Christians so much to eat something like a blood sausage that the apostles found it necessary to have that one thing that they had to say, this is the discipline we should observe. Uh, so you have doctrine and discipline combined within the same council. So we see the same pattern then uh, in the ecumenical councils. Same pattern obtains within the 21 ecumenical councils. The bishops who are in communion with the successor of St. Peter, that is to say the Pope, they meet together to discuss matters of doctrine, which are then confirmed by the Holy See. So often at the ecumenical councils, the Holy Father doesn't attend himself. So for the first ecumenical council, for example, there are legates sent who represent the Pope. And of course, we know at the most recent ecumenical council of Vatican II, the Pope was very much present. But uh, at many of the ecumenical councils, when the bishops of the world assemble, the Pope isn't actually there. His representative uh, is there to confirm or say no, this uh, won't do. So often uh, in the history of the church, a council meets precisely when a doctrine has been challenged and a clear articulation of what the church has always believed is necessary. So just as salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, not by observance of the Mosaic law, had to be defined by the apostles who were in communion with the rock, which is to say St. Peter, upon whom the church was founded, down through the centuries, the councils of the church have defined the true faith. They are not promulgating something contrary to what was before. Rather, they are defining, more clearly defining, what already is true. So this is a very important distinction. A council can't simply out of whole cloth make something up and say, this is now church doctrine. It is rather the means by which what has already been handed down, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, what has already been given to the church then has to be articulated more clearly because there is some difficulty perhaps in understanding it, or we have to really combat a heresy that has arisen, which actually denies that truth that the church has always believed. So for example, and I'm not going to be exhaustive, I can't be exhaustive in a uh, session like this, we only have an hour, uh, but I can give examples of how this took place down through the history of the church. I'll give seven, I'm going to give seven examples. At the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople, these are the first two ecumenical councils. Council of Nicaea is 325. The Council of Constantinople is 381. Together, these two councils give us the creed, the Nicene Creed. We call it the Nicene Creed, but it's really the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. So it's really uh, two councils together give us the creed that we confess at church every single week. At every uh, holy day, uh, we say the creed. Every Sunday, we say the creed. And this creed was developed against the innovation of Arius. Arius was an Egyptian priest who denied the divinity of Jesus Christ. So uh, once Christianity became legal around the year uh, 313, Arius began spreading his errors. He did it by teaching the dock workers in Alexandria, which was at the time uh, the biggest port in the Roman Empire, teaching the dock workers his hymns of falsehood. The dock workers would sing these hymns, the sailors would hear them, and they would sail all over the Roman Empire spreading the lies of Arius. So through the Ecumenical Council, Nicaea first and then Constantinople, we get an articulation of the doctrine of the Trinity. God, there, there is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so it is only because of Arius and his lies that the church found it necessary to get together, develop an ecumenical council, and then say, this is what we truly believe promulgate the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, obviously, the church had always believed that Jesus is divine, that God is one, and that there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We have the same three persons of the Trinity. It is simply at Nicaea, at Nicaea and at Constantinople, it gets articulated. Dan Brown, I don't know if you remember that horrific 
uh, book that uh, Dan Brown put out, he said, oh, Christians only began to believe in the divinity of Christ after 225. This is, this is, of course, an obvious lie. It's a misunderstanding of what the church has done uh, in promulgating doctrines, in defending her truth. She always believed Jesus was divine. It's simply in 225, she had, to, she had to promulgate, to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity because they were facing liars uh, like Dan, or I mean, like Arius, and of course, Dan Brown's a liar too, facing liars whom they had to set straight. Second example, the Second Council of Nicaea in 787. We remember that the Muslims uh, blast out of Arabia in 636, and they very quickly take over many cities in the Middle East, including Alexandria, including Jerusalem, and, and, and including uh, the Dam Damascus in Syria. They're taken over, and one of the things that they do is commit what's called iconoclasm, the smashing of icons, because they associate the use of icons in worship with idolatry. And what the church has to do after a long, over a century, as you say, say you think about uh, that, that uh, Jerusalem falls around uh, 636, and not until 787, so fully 150 years later, an ecumenical council is called to combat the Muslims, but really, ultimately, to affirm the truth of the use of icons, that they are not idolatry, they do not constitute idolatry at all. The church has always used icons from her infancy, and so therefore we can't uh, uh, suddenly uh, throw them out and simply have whitewashed tombs as our churches. And so the, the church pronounces them good. She had always believed that icons were holy, true, good, and right. But at the Ecumenical Council at Nicaea in 787, they once again affirm their use. Third example, we have the First and Second Lateran Councils. The First uh, Lateran Council is in 1123. This means it takes place at uh, the Lateran Basilica in Rome, which is the Holy Father's uh, Cathedral. Uh, the first is in 1123. The second Lateran Council is in 1139. And through these two ecumenical councils in the 12th century, celibacy becomes mandatory. Now, why? You say, what? Celibacy became mandatory in the Latin church that late? How is it that it took that long uh, when this was a, a practice from apostolic times? Uh, why would it take so long for celibacy, be, celibacy as a discipline to be mandatory in the Latin church, not until 1123, 1139. What happened? Well, obviously, it only is going to happen after the schism occurred in 1054 with the Orthodox churches, with the churches of the East. Uh, there wasn't going to be a mandatory celibacy when all the churches of the East, uh, for the most part, uh, with the exception of the Malankar and Malabar churches in India, when all the churches, with those two exceptions, with uh, all the churches of the East observing a uh, married priesthood, they aren't going to have a ecumenical council of the Latin bishops and declare celibacy mandatory for all priests of the West. So it's only after the split that the church take the step of mandating clerical celibacy, that is to say, the church will marry only men that are not married, or if a uh, man is married, he and his wife uh, will live a continent life following his ordination. So there's a, uh, uh, a split that leads to the church declaring uh, this discipline to be mentored. Now remember, this is a discipline, but it took an ecumenical council, two ecumenical councils, to make it a uh, mandatory discipline for the entire, at the time, Catholic Church, the entire Western Church. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Maronites were in communion with the Holy See at the time. Uh, never was uh, celibacy mandated for the Maronites. So it's an interesting uh, historical aside. Fourth example, Fourth Lateran Council in 1215. 
in response to the lies of the Albigensians. Remember, these people were Manichaean dualists in the south of France, and they denied the goodness of the sacraments, not only the goodness of the sacraments, the goodness of the body. They denied the reality that Jesus in the sacrament of Holy Communion is present body, blood, soul, and divinity. So in denying that, uh, and, and really the goodness of all the sacraments, I mean, they had things like suicide hostels where they would help people starve themselves to death. Uh, in response to these lies, the Holy See uh, convenes a uh, ecumenical council, the bishops of the world get together, and they promulgate the doctrine of transubstantiation. The substance of the bread and the wine is completely transformed to become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. This is the doctrine of transubstantiation. Obviously, the church had believed in this from the beginning. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, this is why some of you are sick and some have died, because you did not discern properly the body and blood when you, before you took communion. The church has always believed that it is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in the elements of Holy Communion. But it is not until 1215 that the doctrine of transubstantiation is promulgated. So this is an important uh, time in the history this is where we get Eucharistic adoration, it's where we get Eucharistic processions, it's where we get the beautiful hymns that St. Thomas Aquinas wrote uh, in honor of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. So this is only 800 years ago. Church has believed it for 2,000 years. Only does it come promulgated, articulated as transubstantiation in 1215. Fifth example, the Council of Trent. In 1563 is when it uh, ends. We see that the Holy See, the, the, uh, the successor of St. Peter, has to combat the Protestants. Remember that the Protestant Revolution began in 1517, really after an ecumenical council that was complete failure. I mean, uh, uh, one, one that had ended in, in 15. Uh, that, that had been in uh, 1513, 1517, uh, you see the ecumenical council and Luther begins his revolution uh, on Eve you know, of All Saints, uh, uh, 1517, and the, the world sort of descends into turmoil, and it takes the church a long time to respond, uh, but the wheels get moving, and uh, she eventually has an ecumenical council, uh, it meets for uh, nearly 20 years. And what comes out of it? What comes out of it is the catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, we think of the catechism that came out uh, back uh, in the early 90s. We think of that as being the catechism. But really, uh, the Council of Trent uh, produced the catechism because of all of the errors uh, that the Protestants were teaching with regard to ecclesiology, with regard to polity with regard to sacramental theology. There were so many errors that had to be corrected and not that the church hadn't believed what she articulates in the catechism. She had always believed what she articulates. She is articulating the faith as a whole. All these other ecumenical councils before had given uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine about icons, the doctrine about transubstantiation. In at Trent, we get the whole kit and caboodle. The entire faith is summarized in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and this is then published in all kinds of languages and spread uh, throughout the Catholic world. We also see in the Council of Trent the codification of the Mass. This doesn't happen, of course, until uh, 1570 with the Missal of St. Pius uh, V, uh, but it is the Council that says we have to codify the Mass because of all the liturgical abuses that are occurring in places. People don't know when they go into a church whether it's truly the mass or if it isn't. So what do we have to do? We call an ecumenical council together and say, this is what the mass is, this is what the mass is not. Uh, the, that particular uh, codification of the mass had a 200 year exemption. If the liturgy was older 
uh, than 200 years before uh, 1570, so say it's 1370 or older, they can keep it. So, so Toledo keeps the Mozarabic rite and the, uh, we see the Ambrosian rite in, in uh, Milan and, and in Switzerland, they get to retain that. And indeed in England, uh, the Sarum rite could have been retained if it hadn't already been rocked by the Protestant revolution. So, so the codification of the mass has to take place because so many innovations were occurring. There were so many innovations coming out of Protestant Europe that the church had to say, this is what the mass is, this is what is not. And, but we also see within this beautiful council at Trent where they have the uh, doctrine covered with regard to the sacraments, uh, with regard to uh, the catechism, we also see discipline that has to be undertaken as well. There were so many abuses happening. The council also tackled subjects like, what do we do with a priest who has inherit, inherited his father's benefice? Can he pass it down to his son? This is actual question. The way we were saying, said, I felt that they said back in the 12th century that celibacy had been mandated for priests of the Latin church. Yes, it had. Were they observing it? No. And so what was happening is a priest would have a benefice, that is to say, a parish from which he took all the income. And so a lot of times the tithes amounted to quite a bit of money. So it was a great incentive for him to keep it in the family. And so there was a danger of the priesthood becoming a priestly caste so that uh, properties would be handed down from one priest to the next generationally. So no longer does it matter what the Holy Spirit says, it matters that I can hand my stuff down to my son and that my grandson hopefully one day will get it too. So Trent has to address this abuse, the fact that there's so many men living incontinent lives. And then not only that, not only are they not, only are they not chaste, they're also greedy and they're handing down what they have received uh, from the church uh, to be a shepherd, but rather than being a shepherd, they're a wolf and they're giving it to their sons. And who's being exploited? All the people who are giving their tithes. So Trent has to address this abuse. So we see, again, just as we saw at the very first council at Jerusalem in Acts 15, we have doctrine promulgated and discipline. So we see that councils deal with not just faith and morals. Councils will also often address questions of governance, that is to say, discipline. Here's the doctrine. This is what we believe. Here's the discipline. This is how we live out what we believe. So discipline and doctrine are sometimes both handled at the self-same council. Sixth example. 1870, Vatican I. This was the council that was cut short uh, by Garibaldi when he invaded Rome and all of the uh, bishops had to go home. Uh, the French troops were sent back to France. Uh, Rome was left defenseless and uh, Garibaldi, uh, against the will of the people, united Italy. But in 1870, what was the issue? 16 years before, what had he, what had the Holy Father done? Pius IX had promulgated the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. And he had done this as the Holy Father and said that now, henceforth, this doctrine that the church has believed, it's so ancient uh, that even today the Muslims say that Mary is the greatest woman who ever lived. They even took that with them into their faith. They don't call it the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, but uh, we can see that it was present uh, in the church even as in the seventh century. So, so omnipresent within the church that the Muslims took it in as uh, part of their heresy. Uh, this doctrine is finally in 1854 promulgated. We see it affirmed, obviously, at Lourdes, when Our Lady comes and says, I am the Immaculate Conception. But there's lots of debate, lots of uh, turmoil, because the Holy Father did it uh, without consultation of the uh, Eastern churches, that is to say, uh, the Orthodox. 
And so uh, the church has to address, does the Pope, the successor of St. Peter, the man who uh, stands in uh, place of the rock, uh, the person uh, who uh, can promulgate doctrines, does he have that capacity? And of course, at Vatican I, uh, the, the uh, Ecumenical Council decides indeed, yes, uh, the Pope, when speaking ex cathedra, that is to say, from the chair of St. Peter, the feast day that we celebrate uh, every uh, 22nd of February, when he speaks ex cathedra, does he have uh, the capacity to promulgate doctrines on matters of uh, uh, faith and morals? And is he protected by a special dispensation of the Holy Spirit from error? And the assembled bishops said yes, that uh, the Pope, when speaking ex cathedra on matters of faith and morals, is in fact infallible. Now, he doesn't exercise that ministry uh, very often. He's only officially done it, uh, really, uh, uh, since, since that time in 1950, when the doctrine of the Assumption was promulgated by the Holy Father. And of course, that didn't take place at, a, uh, at an ecumenical council. That was simply uh, Pius XII, Pius XII uh, promulgating the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary. And, and so uh, we see that in 1870, Vatican I, uh, both promulgates a doctrine which the church had always believed and responds to the uproar that occurred out of the East as a result of him on his own promulgating the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th, 1854. Seventh example, Vatican II, which of course ended, as you know, in 1965, and most of what Vatican II dealt with was discipline. We see the, the uh, mass is uh, able to be translated into the vernacular, uh, which wasn't really that new. The church had been doing that uh, for centuries before we think about how in the, in the mass, even today, uh, the curie is in Greek, which indicates that first the mass was in Greek and then that it later got translated into the vernacular, the Vulgate, the vulgar language, that is to say Latin. And so we have uh, uh, Greek and Latin side by side, even within the text of the mass to this day. Uh, it's something that Cyril and Methodius did uh, in, 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 in the 800s as well. But where do we see doctrine? We see it in the decree of the Catholic churches of the Eastern Rite. What the church did uh, in 1964, uh, with the promulgation of this particular decree, is pronounced what had always been true, but not always made manifest. Remember that Pius IX, as great a pope as he was, had actually appointed Latin bishops to Eastern seas. There were so many Catholics in uh, the Transcarpathian Mountains, uh, so many Catholics there observing uh, the Byzantine rite, uh, the the uh, Holy Father actually appointed Latin bishops to Latinize people who are Eastern Catholics, people who had been East, who using Eastern liturgies since the time of Cyril and Methodius, uh, were asked to uh, change and become uh, Latin Catholics. This was a, a travesty. There's no other way to uh, describe uh, really what Pius IX did, and in the uh, decree on the Catholic Churches of the Eastern Rite, we see that all the rites of the church are of equal dignity. They all enjoy the same rights and have the same obligations. This is something the church, again, had always believed, but only in 1964 do we see vindication come for the work of St. Cyril and Methodius, who over and over again uh, in their work in Eastern Europe, gone back to Rome and said, can we translate the mass into Old Slavonic, what we today would call Old Slavonic? Can we translate the scriptures? Can we create for them an alphabet because they don't even read and write? Can we do everything we need in order to make the gospel accessible to them, the mass accessible to them so they can understand both what is spoken in the word and what is offered in the divine liturgy, 
can we translate? And of course, the, the Holy Father said over and over again, yes. Uh, people resisted uh, and said, no, you, the Mass has to be in Latin. And the Holy Father said, no, translate the Mass. Okay, that happened in the 800, 1100 years later. Finally, the Holy See says, never again, never again will Latin bishops be appointed to Eastern Seas. Never again will the size of the Latin church be used to diminish in any way uh, the venerable traditions of our brothers in the East, whose churches are smaller, uh, but of no less dignity, of no less honor. So this is an example of, again, doctrine side by side with a council that was concerned pr principally uh, really with discipline. Here's the faith, how do we articulate it in the modern world? So having defined councils as really defining, being principally concerned with defining doctrines, uh, it's easy to understand exactly what a synod is. Uh, really what we have is council being a Latin word and, and synod being a Greek word, and they both mean the same thing. But in the practice of the church, councils and synod are not the same thing. As I said, a council is all of the bishops of the world, as many as we can assemble, promulgating then in union with the Holy See, in union with the rock, uh, who is a successor of St. Peter, we have uh, doctrines promulgated for the good of the church. This is what we believe. And occasionally combined with that council, uh, we see disciplines uh, really uh, enforced and we, we see the church concerned with governance too. But with synods, synods are a little different because not every difficulty or challenge, we might say, every trial in the church has necessarily to do with doctrine. Uh, rather, we encounter issues with how the faith will be lived out, and not just on a universal level, like, like for example, when I said about the discipline of celibacy being made mandatory in 1123 and 1139 at the First and Second Lateran Councils. Uh, that was a universal uh, practice for the Western Church, for the Latin Church. Uh, often, synods have to deal with what has to be done on a local level. How will the church govern her members? And this is important to remember then that every bishop is uh, the prince of his diocese. He is the supreme authority with regard to the law. Obviously, uh, the pope is the one that puts together the canons. But then every diocese can have laws particular to it because the church has to be governed a little bit different here, perhaps, than it has to be governed there. Uh, one way in Africa, another way in Europe, one way in America, another way in Asia. So the, so the uh, bishop has to then uh, perhaps say, how do I deal with a particular issue? This is happening to us right now. This is current. How do we deal, for example, with crimes? They should, they appear to be crimes. That seems to me that they're obviously crimes, but there's no legislation with regard to them, so, with regard to people using social media to commit acts of unchastity. There is nothing in the canons about this. Obviously, the canons that were put together in 1983 did not anticipate this. And before that, 1917, how could they have? So right now, in dioceses across the nation, particularly in Western countries where people have access to these uh, devices and they carry them in their pockets, uh, how do we deal with uh, the man that was once secretary uh, to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops who was caught uh, committing these very crimes, which aren't actually defined anywhere as crimes. How do we deal with it? Well, a synod of getting everybody together, how I need advice, how can I in my diocese promulgate a law by which the church can be governed and we can punish offenders? We can actually make it an offense 
and then we can actually punish those who offend the law. So there's, there's a, a great need for synods on not just a universal level, but also on a local level. So not just uh, the church having a synod uh, as we are now, the synod on synodality, which is a, a universal uh, synod. Uh, there can also be local synods. Thus, the Pope or really any bishop can, can convene a synod as an advisory body to confront current issues having to do with how we proclaim the truth. How do we proclaim the truth? Remember, they're not deciding what is true and what is false. They are not promulgating a doctrine, but they are ready, rather talking about sort of like, what are the best practices? How do I make real the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception? How do I make real the doctrine of transubstantiation? So for example, in my, in my diocese, the personal identity of the Church of St. Peter, uh, we have our own missile. It's a, it's a different use of the Roman rite. And at the end of the mass for Corpus Christi, the rubrics indicate this mass should conclude with a procession of the Blessed Sacrament in the public streets. This says it. This is a way that my diocese might be governed differently than your diocese because there needs to be, particularly among people who are converts to the faith, an understanding that Jesus is present in the Blessed Sacrament, body, blood, soul, and divinity. They need to see it. How do we do it? We walk through the streets with it every single year, every one of our parishes. In Latin dioceses, that isn't the case. We might have the, the bishop might, might go to one uh, parish here uh, and then go to a different parish the next year, but we have to be governed a little bit differently uh, because of our particular background. So we process with the Blessed Sacrament every year at the conclusion of the Corpus Christi Mass, every single year. So what is the most famous synod in the history of the church that came, that had sort of uh, earth shattering uh, results uh, that uh, have implications for us even today? This is the Synod of Whitby in 664. Now you might, if you've never heard of it, that's okay. A uh, person who comes from an English background like I do. Uh, this is something I've been learning about since I was a kid. This had to do with Celtic versus Roman praxis. So if you know anything about the history of the British Isles, we know that uh, when the Romans abandoned England in 410, they also uh, left the Christians who were there very vulnerable. St. Patrick was stolen from Britain, taken to Ireland, and went to France, became a bishop, went back to Ireland and converted the Irish. Well, those Irish uh, practices were different from the Roman practices. And the Irish went across, particularly St. Aidan, went across the sea and began to evangelize Scotland and Northern England. Then at the same time, around the same time, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, was St. Augustine. He had been sent by St. Gregory, and he begins introducing Roman practices to the south of England. So you have two different praxis in England, in the same nation. In the north, you have the Irish way, the Celtic way. In the south, you have the Roman way because of this uh, unique history of uh, England being abandoned by the Roman legions in 410. So what happens? You have no agreement between when the date of Easter is. They're using different calendars. And in the king's own court, that is to say, within his own household, he has some people celebrating Easter on one day and some on another day. In fact, there was a year in which the king was feasting at, for Easter, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, while his wife was still observing her Lenten penances. <laughs> so, within the same household, two differences uh, of when Easter is celebrated. So there had to be an agreement. They said, we have to have an agreement about when is the date of Easter. Are we going to follow uh, Iona in the north? Or are we going to follow Canterbury in the south? So uh, the decision came down in the end. Uh, the king uh, called the synod and uh, the bishops came together. In the end, 
they decided that England would unite in adopting the Roman custom. They, though they had both been equally evangelized uh, by the, in the North, by the Irish in the South, uh, uh, by the Italians, they would ultimately come together and observe not Celtic practices, not the Celtic rite, but rather the Roman rite. And this is based on the Petrine office. Uh, the king, of course, had played a role in, get, in assembling all the bishops, and he did indeed say that he preferred uh, uh, the Roman rite, uh, but he did it for what was best uh, for his people. Now, that's an example of where a secular authority uses a synod uh, for the good. The bishops and he cooperate in an agreement, and it's a beautiful, uh, it's a, a beautiful outcome. And of course, uh, to, to, to this day, uh, we still have uh, Roman practices observed uh, in the Catholic dioceses of England and Ireland. But synods can also be abused and can be used by secular rulers to enforce, and, and enforce the spirit of the times. So uh, remember, there was a time when there were as many or more Arian bishops as there were Catholic bishops. And at the Synod of Carthage in 44, uh, the King of the Vandals, Huneric, got all of the bishops under his power uh, that were in the territories that he controlled to come together. And the Catholic bishops said, well, why don't we have uh, uh, the bishops outside of your lands come to, and it'll be like a real council. Uh, he said, no, we're just going to send it to the people who are under my control. He said, when you make me rule of the world, then you can include those people too. But I'm not rule of the world yet. So... Uh, I'm going to have my Arian heretics here. He didn't call them heretics, obviously. He, he, Huneric was an Arian himself. He said, well, the Arians and uh, the Nicene Christians, which, of course, we would call Catholics, uh, they get together and uh, figure out how we're going to coexist. Well, it didn't have anything to do with coexistence, but really simply a synod called to browbeat the Catholics into submission and to becoming heretics. Uh, they refused. I mean, we give... Uh, uh, praise and glory to God that the Synod of Carthage in 44 was a complete failure. Uh, Huneric died later that year, but not before he martyred a number of the Catholic bishops and sent 500 of them, 500 of them into exile uh, to the island of Corsica, which at the time uh, the Vandals controlled all of the islands in the Western Mediterranean. And so he sent uh, 500 uh, Catholic bishops uh, to Corsica uh, because uh, they would not convert. So it wasn't so much a synod for advice as it was the enforcement of a particular lie. So we could see that a synod, uh, as it was at Whitby, can be used for all that is holy, good, right, and true. And they weren't even debating about what was true. They were just arguing over uh, uh, when the date of Easter should be. Uh, at the Synod of Carthage, it was actually uh, a, a king, a secular ruler, trying to introduce a lie and saying, you need to accept that. And so he tried to use a synod of the church to force other people to adopt a lie, to deny the faith. So uh, we see that uh, uh, synods uh, can, be, can be both uh, uh, great good for the church and also can have nefarious purposes. And, and uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the fact that so, that, that so many were killed and exiled, you could see as a negative. Uh, outcome, but really, it's it's a it's a great witness to the faith. Carthage, forty four, is a great witness to the faith that the synod was a failure uh, when a lie was proposed as true, and so many refused uh, to buckle under. Since the Second Vatican Council, uh, the Holy Father, this is something that Paul the Sixth began. The Holy Father has had an advisory body. Uh, the members of, of which are elected by bishops' conferences and the Union of Superiors General. So uh, the Union of Superiors General will send uh, to the Synod uh, a superior from this order and that order. And then the bishops' conferences of the world will say, we're sending these particular men. I mean, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops does this all the time. In fact, it's one of the things that it's one of the elections that's really watched at uh, their uh, annual meetings is who's going to be sent uh, to the Synod of Bishops uh, with uh, the Holy Father uh, to be on that advisory body 
that meets in Rome. And when the Holy Father calls a synod, well, there they are. And they, they uh, are, are, are available to uh, advise him. They vote on proposals for the Pope's consideration. So it's not a council. It's not all the bishops of the world. It is the conferences of bishops sending particular men to advise the Pope on particular matters. Don't confuse it with a council having to do with doctrine. It is a synod having to do with discipline. How do we proclaim the truth that all of us believe? And this, uh, when they have these synods and they, and they have these votes, they are the basis for what is called post-synodal apostolic exhortation, all right? So they, there's uh, not typically decrees issued after them, but even if they are, if there would be a decree issued from a synod uh, of the type that has been around since 1965, if there would be a decree, it would have to be one that was ratified by the Pope. So it isn't something like uh, the bishops uh, vote on it. And because a majority of the bishops uh, said this, therefore it has to happen. And, uh, and, and we see that the, that the uh, uh, democracy triumphs. No, the Holy See is a monarchy. And, uh, and anything that the bishops do in terms of advising the Pope has to be ratified by the Pope. Uh, he has the ultimate authority to throw out what the uh, uh, members have advised or to accept it and to uh, uh, pronounce it and send out an apostolic exhortation uh, saying this is how we're going to address this particular issue. Uh, the most famous time that a, uh, uh, the Holy Father put together a, uh, an advisory body, a synod of sorts, uh, was when uh, uh, St. Paul VI uh, expanded the council that John XXIII had put together with regard to the question of uh, contraception. I talked about, about, talked a little bit, if you were my presentation last year, I talked about this a little bit last year, where uh, the Holy Father had to, he said, I want to get advice from cardinals, from bishops, from priests, indeed from laity, from married couples. And what should we do about this question? Uh, the pill had come out in 1960. It had been invented by a Catholic, John Rock. And uh, are we going to change the teaching on contraception or are we going to retain the constant teaching of the church that it is immoral uh, in every circumstance? And so the uh, council came back and they wrote a draft report and they said, we think the teaching on the church should be changed. This was bishops, priests, lady. Like I said, there was a, over 60 people on this council. And, uh, and the draft opinion that they had uh, issued was leaked. So for two years, actually three years, it was, it was, I think it was leaked in 65, the world waited with bated breath for the Holy Father to pronounce that the teaching on contraception in the Catholic Church had changed. But in fact, what did the Holy Father do? He rejected what his counselors had said, uh, and in 1968 issued, uh, in my opinion, the most important thing written in the 20th century, Humanae Vitae, and said, no, uh, the church does not change her teaching. Not only will I not change the teaching, I am incapable of teaching it. I don't have the capacity, I don't have the authority to change it, because all I can do is promote what has already been handed to me. All I can do is articulate, perhaps in a new way, what has already been given to me. I cannot come up with a new teaching. I cannot take what has been handed down from the fathers, from God the Father, and change it. That is not the authority of the Pope. So it's a great witness to the reality uh, of uh, the church and why she is governed in this particular way. So when we have, when we see synods, uh, that's a great uh, example of how synods uh, can be abused. They shouldn't be discussing matters of faith and morals, uh, because this is the job of all the bishops together. Uh, this is what, we, what this is what is accomplished at, uh, at councils. 
when official teachings of the Catholic Church are uh, promulgated. Rather, uh, we are simply, these are mere representatives saying this is how we think uh, the church should deal with this particular issue. Uh, this is our advice to you, Pope Francis, about how to do this or that. Uh, not, this is what is true, this is what is false. It's not that at all. Uh, a synod should talk about how the disciplines by which we will promote what we already agree is a doctrine. The doctrines aren't to be discussed. The fact that a working group under the Pope's authority was talking about whether contraception is or, not, is, or is not uh, is a scandal in itself. This should never even been talked about. We simply take it for granted this is what the church's teaching is, and we accept it, and we don't learn then how do we apply it, which is what the Holy Father did ultimately in Kiwana Vitae. Uh, so synods aren't called to talk about what is true and what is false. They're called to talk about how we implement the truth. How do we uh, promote the gospel and thus uh, in, in our modern circumstances, in our modern context, save souls. So uh, this is, um, uh, in this context then, uh, we can understand then the synod synodality, which I will talk about uh, next week at the second session and offer you my critique and, and uh, how uh, we might better understand it and uh, prepare uh, for what might come out uh, of it and, and uh, uh, using, as, using the, the, the historical context I've given uh, is, is the means by which we can, we can interpret uh, what is uh, true and false about it. Uh, that's the conclusion of my presentation for today, and, and then uh, uh, we'll, I uh, guess, take a break and uh, be uh, available for your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father Bergman. Um, that was just a wonderful introduction to synods and putting it in the context of um, the different councils and giving us those examples. Uh, that was just wonderful. Um, the way you presented it through the stories of the different councils really helped to bring it to life for me. So thank you for that. Okay, um, first I just want to ask if there's anyone on screen who has a question. I think I saw a hand when I was making my announcements, but um, uh, yeah, Shane and, and Gina, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, uh, Father, quick question. Um, is there a precedent for when a synod kind of overstepped its bounds and got into doctrine and then the Pope went ahead and kind of promulgated the error? Sort of the, uh, the antithesis of what happened with Umanavite, right? Yeah. Right, right. Never, never. Uh, one, of, one of the great, uh, this is again, the, the, uh, uh, the, the doctrine of papal infallibility is true. That the Holy Father, uh, throughout the history of the church has been protected from doing this. And, and I, think that, I think that we'd be certain that if he had done something like that in the past, it would have been the Antichrist and we're still here. So, so uh, we, we, we can be certain uh, that has never happened. Okay, thank you. A number of questions have come in about who participates in a synod. So I'm gonna try to condense these into one, but one question that's coming in is um, the people involved in a synod, and you, you kind of answer it in the lecture, but is it only bishops or do um, other priests and the laity, can they be involved too? And then another question, a uh, person is asking a question, does the laity have an obligation to participate in synods at the diocesan level? And what would that participation look like, if so? All right, so, so the, the bishop, because he is the supreme legislature, supreme legislator in his diocese, may decide from whom he will receive advice. So the, typically, he would call his priests together. I think that's really what's happening uh, I use that example of what do we do with these crimes being committed on the internet. Uh, uh, but we also would say, sure, invite the chancellor, often as a layman, uh, invite, in, in, invite uh, other people who can then assemble together and, and provide uh, really necessary input. I mean, every good leader knows that he needs to take as many gifts as he can from those who assembled for him. I mean, the, the, the reality is the Holy Spirit is moving and putting people in our lives, putting people in our path. So uh, every man doesn't know everything, and he needs uh, the gifts of knowledge and wisdom that the Holy Spirit has given to others, uh, like, like uh, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. So uh, the, 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 uh, if the bishop says, please participate, I, of course, would say yes. 
uh, this is one of the things that all of us uh, vow. When I, when I uh, got down on my knees, put my hands between the bishop's hands, he said, will you obey me and my successors? I said, yes. If I don't say yes, I don't get ordained. I, now I, I was ordained. So, I, uh, so if he asks for that, I would say, uh, if uh, possible, if at all possible, to say yes. So I don't, no, no one isn't obligated the way that I am, uh, because I made a, uh, in a sense, uh, it was it's a, it's a sacred promise. It's not a vow. I made a sacred promise. Yes, I will always obey you. Uh, uh, so you're not obligated the way that I am. But still, it's something, if the bishop's asking for your gifts, please give them to him. Thank you. Um, as a kind of short kind of follow-up to that, um, so when I was asking, you gave the example of the king having called it synod. Are secular rulers still able to call synods together, or does it have to come uh, through a member of the hierarchy of the church? No, no, it would absolutely be today uh, through the hierarchy of the church. Remember that there was a long time in the history of the church of Cicero papism. Now, that was not the case in England ever, uh, except until we get to Henry VIII, and of course then we have, you know, I'm the head of the church and I'm the king, you know, but that, that's Protestantism. Uh, but certainly in the, in the ancient history of the church, we have a mixing of uh, roles in a lot of places. And, and also there was a cooperation between the church and state. The, 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 uh, uh, very much today, in a lot of places, the church and state are almost at odds with each other. Uh, not the church's fault, it's the, uh, the state trying to protect herself somehow from religion. But, uh, but the, the uh, uh, never would we say uh, a secular ruler today would call a synod never. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Arthur, did I see that you had your hand raised? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, this is related to the earlier question. So based on what you're saying, a synod shouldn't be uh, discussing things on faith and morals. And, and if that's the case, we shouldn't be concerned that a group of bishops in Germany might push a homosexual marriage agenda or something like that no, well 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 they that is not a, first of all that's not a synod okay. uh, they are talking about the synodal way and saying basically uh they want to have a german national church that goes its own way and and you have even with, with regard to the question i think mean, i think you raise a great example arthur uh, uh you have because germany is so off the rails including the bishops because in this synodal way that they're doing it and having these discussions about things like homosexual unions, uh, blessing of homosexual unions. You have even men like Walter Casper, who is hardly the redoubt of orthodoxy, taking the German bishops to task. So you completely misunderstand what a synod is. So it's really amazing uh, to, to watch Walter Casper uh, saying to them, you guys are, are, are completely wrong and you're not listening to the Holy Father at all. Uh, and you are setting. You're going to break your. You're going to break your neck. He. That's the. That's the uh, metaphor that he used. Uh, because you completely misunderstand what a synod is, and this is not what it is. What you're doing is not what it is. So it's amazing. Uh, it's actually an amazing time to be alive to watch this. It's. It's. It's tragic. What's happening in Germany is tragic, uh, but it. But the church is in no way threatened by it. Everybody in the world, from the Pope. To, like I said, cardinals like Walter Casper is united against what the Germans are doing and saying this is wrong. It's amazing that so many German bishops are participating. I can't understand it. I can't understand why the bishops, why the bishops are, are, aren't just walking out. Uh, but, but no, we are not threatened by that at all. Thank you. Um, this question is coming in from Cecilia. She's wondering, could you um, define for her, we've used the word synod and you were just speaking about things being done in a synodal way. She's also wondering, what does it mean? What does synodality mean? Could you just define those different phrases and how they're being used? Uh, a, a synod is an advisory council and synodality is uh, being willing to take advice. Uh, it's, that is to say, uh, we are able to uh, listen and, again, use the gifts of those that the Lord has placed in our path. And, and, uh, and, and that means uh, really listening to, to uh, uh, all the voices. So, so one of the things, and we'll get to this next week. I, want, I don't, I don't want to preempt what I'm going to say next week. Uh, but, but if the Holy Spirit has put people in our way, uh, 
and 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 people have a have uh, something to say. We cannot uh, say I'm just going to listen to you and I can listen to, to to any of you. And so that means uh, that, for example, when Cyril and Methodius were translating the Mass into uh, Slavonic and writing the scriptures in Slavonic and writing the Missal in Slavonic. There were two groups of people that the Holy Spirit had put in the Holy Father's way. There were Latin bishops who said, this is heresy. I mean, it, it sounds absurd now. that he, Translating the mass into a language that people can understand, uh, that there were so many bishops who considered that to be heresy. And here was this man uh, alone saying, this is what the people need. This is what the people are asking me for. It converted all of Eastern Europe. So uh, if the Holy Father had excluded the voice of the minority, that revolution that occurred and issued in literally the salvation of souls of millions would never have happened. So we have to, we have to not just listen to the big group of people who are screaming their heads off, but we sometimes have to also hear the little man. Uh, and, and by the same token, we don't magnify uh, the little man if what he's saying is contrary to what is true and what has always been taught. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a uh, synodality means a willingness to uh, listen honestly and earnestly. Uh, and, and, and I'll, and I'll uh, as I said, next week, that'll be really the topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a beautiful way um, to explain it. Edwin, why don't you go ahead and un unmute yourself and ask your question? All right, thank you. Uh, Father, you mentioned, if I heard you correctly, that there's nothing in the canon which is like um, to cover these crimes on the internet, social right. media. Right. Okay. So kind of a two-part question. So isn't the real crime that whatever they're doing on the internet is a violation of breaking their vows, whether it's, you know, a hookup or whatever it is, and B, What's if they were doing it, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago on, on the phone, or I'm really dating myself now using a beeper, <laughs> what, what's the difference? It's a violation of, uh, of breaking their vows. It's, it's something that's obviously wrong. And you and I can see that it is such. But in order to be convicted of a crime, you have to actually break a law that's written down. In order for a man to be so, so, so when a person, say a person, uh, we see this happening all the time, too many times it's been so heart-wrenching and horrible of priests who have literally molested children. They, that is a crime. It is written down. And for that crime, they can be deposed. They are stripped of their faculties. They can never serve as a priest again. Praise be to God. But what if the guy never touches anybody? It's everything is virtual. It's all done over the internet. He's not ever actually even met him. They've never even been in the same state. There's been no physical contact whatsoever. What do you do? So that's, that's what we're talking about. It isn't the things that, are, the, that, that we know are crimes and they're written down. It's the things that are obviously wrong and a horrible uh, transgression of the vow that they made of chastity at the ordination. And yet there's a law against it. So we have to adjust so that we can make it a crime and so this thing cannot so a guy can't uh I go right to the edge of uh and then and still be able to serve as a priest you understand it's it's not it's not about things that already are we know are defined as crimes it's things that 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 we that never we never even thought of and so now we have to we have to adjust adjust mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have just a few more minutes left, so I think we can get in two more questions. Um, I have one here from Annie, and then Lori will try to get to yours as well. So Annie is asking, um, are synods democratic in nature in that there could be votes and majority rules when it comes to the development of doctrine? No, uh, the, 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 they aren't democratic at all, uh, because remember, it's merely a sampling uh, councils are democratic. Councils are democratic in that they, uh, the bishops all together assembled, vote on something uh, about, for example, 
uh, the 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 uh, doctrine of the Trinity. That was that was the, the vote. I mean, there were there were people that were advocating at the council the Arian position. It sounds it sounds insane, but yes, at the Council of Nicaea, at the Council of Constantinople, there were people advocating for the Arian position that Jesus wasn't divine. And so there was a vote taken, and obviously the uh, Orthodox uh, position prevailed. The Catholic position prevailed, and the Holy Father put a stamp of approval on it. So what could have happened? What could have happened in Nicaea is the now no, it couldn't have happened because the Holy Spirit protected us from it. But imagine that the the Arian position had somehow prevailed at Nicaea. Well, then the Holy Father would have said no. That is not true. And so uh, that hasn't, that, there's, that's ever happened. That's ever happened. Uh, but, we, but even if it did, the Holy Father has the last say. And the, the church is a monarchy. It is not a democracy. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, Lori, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. This one kind of has to do with the same thing Arthur was talking about. When topics are brought up at the Synod, um, a lot of times it's by Germany, but, um, but where they're kind of testing the edge, I guess, is the word. They're kind of, um, they're not, I guess, I understand a lot more about it by being here tonight of what a synod is, but they kind of test the waters as to wording it so as what should we do with our parishioners that are doing this. Um, so are you saying that us as lay people shouldn't really worry about that because it's not do doctrine in the synod? I mean, because no, no, no. as a lay person, we were very, I think Arthur is too, we're very worried sometimes about some of the things that are brought up that are really testing what we believe. A hundred percent. And I think that, that what the, what the uh, uh, Germans have said most recently is the catechism teaching, this is, this is, this is just on, uh, I think within the last week or so, uh, the, what the catechism teaches with regard to homosexual actions, uh, the words need to be changed and so forth. And, and that the, uh, they're actually advocating, this is not, again, it's not a synod at all. It's not a synod. It's simply Germans uh, mouthing off, but uh, this has to be changed, okay? And, and so they make that proposal because we think this will be the more pastoral way to address uh, this. So what are they really doing though? They're saying, by changing what says in the catechism, we're gonna change doctrine. You can't do that. So, so there are ways of addressing a problem. It's like, do we tell the guy how to fish or do we just give him fish? That's a legitimate debate. We have a third party arguing, no, we should let them starve. That isn't, that's not Catholic doctrine. So we can't, we can't introduce this thing coming out from left field. Oh, the new Catholic doctrine is to let all starving people starve. No, no, there's just a debate about whether we give him all the fish he needs or if we teach him how to fish. That, that's what we have debates about. Uh, and, and, and so it's a pastoral practice. How do we implement uh, what is true? There's going to be debates about it. That's fine. That's beautiful. The church wants that. Uh, but there can't be something that says we're just going to throw the whole thing out and do something completely, com completely contrary to what the church has always taught. That will never prevail. And we have to trust in the gift of the Holy Spirit, in the person of the Holy Father, that he will never do that. And then if he does, we got to be looking for Jesus really soon. With that, Father Bergman, would you please conclude us in prayer? And then we'll say goodnight for the evening. Very good. And I'm going to use another, another prayer from our tradition. Uh, and it has to do with the mission of the church and the spread of the gospel, because the purpose of all councils and all synods is that more people come home to Holy Mother Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Almighty God, who did send thy blessed Son to reconcile mankind to thyself, we praise and bless thee for thy servants, whom thou hast sent forth in the power of the eternal spirit to preach the gospel to all nations, by whose prayers and labors thou hast gathered together a great flock in all parts of the world. We also bless thy holy name for those who have lived and suffered and died for thy sake, beseeching thee to give us grace so to follow the good examples, that with them we may at last attain thy heavenly promises. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory.
forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Thank you.